Well, good morning and welcome to the city. My name is Pastor Tony. I'm the lead pastor here at this incredible church. So if this is your first time with us, we want to welcome you, tell you that we love you. We thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedule to come and hang with some of the coolest people in this region. Can I get an amen? amen. We are a church that is alive and we want to be around people that are alive. So elbow your neighbor and tell them, wake up. Come on, wake up, wake up, wake up. Well, listen, we have been in a series on relationships for the last three weeks. And it has been an incredible series because we're learning how to do relationships better. We're learning how to do marriages better. We're learning how to be better parents. We're learning how to be better children to our parents. We're learning how to be better friends, better coworkers. And we've been kind of dissecting relationships because relationships are an inevitability, guys. Like, you, as long as you are in this earth, you are going to be in relationships. So one more time, just look at the person on the other side of you and say, you're stuck with me. It's a part of it, y'all. Right? Right? Some of y'all looked at the side where there was nobody because you didn't want to tell them. Right? But listen, it's an inevitability. So we talked all about love, right? And how we got to learn how to love, not through our feelings only, but what does agape, real love, the love of God actually look like? We talked about commitment. And what does it look like to be committed in a relationship? How commitment is not chains. It's not slavery. We think about commitment as like, oh, no. No, commitment is fun. When it's done the right way, commitment is exciting. It's fire breathing, living, alive. Like, like I'm in a commitment with this woman. Not, you know what? We ain't in a contract. We in a covenant. You know what I'm saying? And this thing is on fire, y'all. You know what I'm saying? It's great. I'm happy. But then last week, I had the privilege and honor of having one of the most intelligent speakers to grace the earth last week. And my wife, Pastor Faith, she crushed it. We talked about communication communication. And I asked her if she would do this one with conflict. She was like, I think you'll be better with that. I don't know what she was trying to say, but you know, so this week I want to talk about the final piece of relationships because every relationship that's healthy will have conflict. But the problem is, is that we allow conflict to be the separator in the relationship. What you've got to understand is conflict doesn't divide. It actually unites when it's done the right way. So we can't allow conflict to push us away. Conflict should actually bring us together. All right? And I'm going to show you guys what that looks like. Because when we're talking about conflict, I'm going to give you a four for four for four. How many of y'all like the Wendy's four for four? Come on, you only got four dollars, you get you some lunch. Praise the Lord, right? Right? Let me get them chicken nuggets and junior bacon cheese and fries and let me get a frosty instead there, sir. I'll pay the extra 39 cents. You know? <laughs> so, so I want to give you guys some four for fours, but I want to kind of break this out through a scripture that we've been using throughout this entire message, which is actually found in Romans chapter 12. And listen, I'm going to need you to really get this because it's the most important component of relationships. And, and the Bible actually says, it says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Stop building your relationships on what you see outside. Stop looking at Instagram and be real. They're not being real because you got three minutes to get it right. Like it's not Twitter or Facebook. Those relationships are not real. Stop trying to be what they are and begin to walk in who you've been created by the one who created. So we're not copying them. In fact, it actually says what we're going to do is we're going to let God transform us. Everybody say, I'm transformed. I'm transformed. Come on, say it one more time. Say, I'm transformed. I'm transformed. I am transformed. I'm not trans. It doesn't say I'm fixed. God isn't going to fix you. He's not fixing you, he's transforming you, which means you are not what you used to be because it says that he's transforming you into a new person. So look at your neighbor again, be like, I'm brand new. I am brand new. So I'm not who I used to, listen, God doesn't want to fix you. He's not interested in fixing the old, broken, disgusted you. 
He's like, listen, how about I just turn you into who you've always been meant to be? You know, actually who you used to be isn't even who you are. I'm about to show you who you really are. That's what God wants to do. Amen? Amen. But he's got to begin that process by changing the way that you think. So we've got to change the way that we think about love. We've got to change the way we think about commitment. We've got to change the way we think about commitment. And then we've got to change the way that we've been thinking about communication. But we've also got to change the way that we fight. Conflict, y'all, has the ability to produce fruit or it has the ability to destroy. It's powerful. So let's look at these conflicts. In fact, I, I kind of wanted to start out by talking with four causes of conflict, four things that create conflict. The first thing that creates conflict is a good one. Not my favorite, but it's a good one. And this is, this is what it is, poor communication. Poor communication creates conflict. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but when you get into a conflict, it always starts with something really small. And then as soon as you open up your mouth, it becomes really big. Oh, come on, somebody. It was just a little small thing. And then by the time you get done talking, we're in a full-fledged, blown-out fallout. Right? And I don't want to read the ah! And it was like, who didn't take out the trash? And now we're ready to like, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm not speaking to you for three days. How about we just find a solution for taking out the trash? It's poor communication. Poor communication is what leads to conflict. We have a small problem that we blow up into something big, right? It, it, listen, we, we see it happen all the time. My wife has a gifting, an anointing to be able to go back historically. I'm like, she should, be, she should write books. She will be like, well, do you know January 1st, 1974 at 1 23 p.m., you were wearing a button-up shirt? Do you remember? And I'm looking at her like, I don't remember what shirt I got on today. <laughs> like, you, 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 like it, it's poor. We started with this, and now we're here, right? So it's a terrible, terrible cause of conflict. In fact, the Bible actually says in Psalms, it says, set a guard over my mouth. You actually need to place something or someone in front of your mouth. Why? Because you got to watch over the door of your lips. Look at what the scripture says. Your, your lips are a door, which means it has the ability to swing or open. And guess who controls that? So you can open that thing up and walk right through. 1949, we weren't even alive, girl. Well, when you were in your mother's womb, I was thinking, you know, it's like. <laughs> or we can keep that thing closed and we'll just deal with the trash. See, the second thing that causes conflict is actually unfulfilled expectations. Listen to me, write this down. All anger, 100% of anger comes from the root of unfulfilled expectations. Every time somebody gets mad or angry, 100% of the time, it's due to unfulfilled expectations. What does that mean? Well, James chapter four, verse number one says this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? What causes conflict? It says, don't they come from your desires, your expectations? Well, you know, I thought they were gonna, and they didn't, and then, and then all of a sudden, they start missing the mark, and they start, and they didn't, and they won't, and they, 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 and then all of a sudden, something rises up in you, frustration, resentment, anger, and in reality, we put these expectations on people. And the truth is, nobody can meet those expectations except one. That's him. They are not, will not, and do not have the capacity to fulfill all of your expectations because they are not God. For too many of us, we're looking for people to fulfill things inside of us that only God can fulfill. But I need you to love me better. You're right, I probably do need to love you better, but the truth of the matter is I'll never be able to love you like you really need to be loved. There's only one who can really love you that way, and that's him. 
because the song said, you've never failed. I'm probably going to let you down at some point. I'm probably going to say something, do something. I'm, like it's, so the, the love that you really need inside of you, you, you got to get that from him. And then I'm going to love you, but, I, but you're not going to be looking for me to be perfect love because he's perfect, not me. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you ain't perfect either. But, but we expect it. Come on, somebody. We expect that. So we've got we've to watch that, which leads me to the third thing. I love this one. It's the third cause for conflict is despising differences. We, get, we begin to despise the differences with them. Come on. You wanted a bad boy till you got with one and you found out he was bad. <laughs> you liked it in the beginning, but you don't like it anymore. Right? You, listen, you thought it was cute when you were cooking all these meals and taking them to lunch and doing all this stuff until you found out he don't cook and you're cooking all the time and you don't want to cook all the time. Come on, somebody. Right? You thought it was cute that you used to could clean her car for her so that you would be, oh, I'm going to clean your car, girl, and wax it up and whatever. Until now, you get in it and look like somebody threw a grenade in there, and you're like, why you got french fry? I just cleaned it yesterday. It was cute back then. Right? We despise the things that used to, come on, somebody, we used to be attractive. Oh, I just love. Now you're like, I'm about to choke this back then. You know, I used to ask my wife, like, what are the kids doing in your car? Like, what's happening in there while you're driving? <laughs> How did we get to this? You know, but it used to be cute. But the thing is, is we start to despise those differences. But I, I, I want to challenge you because I'll be honest, like, Pastor Faith and I, like, she'll tell you, we're, we are different. We have some similarities, but we are different. How we think is different. How we approach situations is different. Like, we are different. But what we have in common is we have God. So you can't go get with somebody different if they ain't got God. You got a mess. But we know where we're going together, but we're approaching it differently. But that's healthy because, listen, it wouldn't be good if she was like me. Two of me would be bad. You understand? It would be bad. But, but we've got different, different whole. Right? And we're complementing each other. And we're covering each other and making each other, right? She doesn't complete me. God completes me. But we're a really good team. Does that make sense? So we've got to be willing to understand that people have differences. In fact, I was looking at basketball, football, baseball. It doesn't matter what team. Every successful championship team is made up of many parts and they all have different skills. Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls would not have been the team that the Bulls were if everybody was like Michael Jordan. And they wouldn't have been if everybody was Scottie Pippen or Dennis. They needed all those differences to become world champions six times. Same thing with the Patriots, the dynasty. If everybody was like Tom Brady, they would have sucked. Because he's slow as molasses. He couldn't have got in the end zone. Right? He would have been a terrible lineman. But he's a great quarterback. And if you surround him with other people who are linemen and other people who can catch the ball and run them, all of a sudden you got a great team and we got a dynasty. So God is bringing us in our differences together and he's making us into a great team. It says in, in uh, Mark, Jesus said this, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. So listen, we, we, we're different, but we got to find a way to unite. So go ahead, look at him and be like, we got to work together. Come on, look at them. Say, we got to work together. Look at them. Look at the person next to you and say, we got to work together. <laughs> right. Come on, man. That's my mom. Tell her you got to work with her. <laughs> but the fourth cause of conflict is the one that most of us in this room wrestle with, which is actually our sin nature. I'll just be honest. One of the reasons we get into fights all the time is because you are fallen. You're sinful. You're full of sin. Like, you, you're just messed up. You're messed up. You are messed up. We're fallen. And we've got to be careful because when it comes to our sinful nature, we'll have a lot of mercy on ourselves, but very little mercy for others. We'll be praying, God, forgive me. Give me another chance. Fill me again. Do it again. 
again, 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 and then that person messes up one time, you'd be like, they're out. We got to be careful of that. Jesus actually talks about that. I'm going to show you guys a little bit later. He had something to say about when we act like that. In fact, Romans says this, for everyone has sinned, everyone, everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. So as many Bible classes as you've taken, you've been saved for 1,700 years, you still mess up? Well, I don't, you mess up? In fact, the Bible says, he who says he's without sin is a liar. Well, come on, I need Jesus. Any of y'all in here need Jesus? I need, I need a little bit more of Jesus, right? Because I, sometimes I mess up. When I'm in the car and I'm driving in traffic, and I'm telling you, I, I be in my mind, I be speaking in tongues, but it is not of the Holy Ghost. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the Lord is reminding me, he's like, these are the people I gave you for your church. And I'm like, Lord, bless them. <laughs> Why don't they know how to drive, Jesus, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I've gotten better because I'm like, they probably do go to my church. And I don't want to be like, hey, pastor, you got that white car with the black roof? Yeah, you were cut me off last week, you know. So I've been getting better at that, trying to know. So we've got these four causes of conflict. And it, when it comes to conflict, you cannot change what's going on around you until you are willing to allow God to change what's going on in you. You'll never change your circumstances until you allow God to transform you, your heart. So let me give you four ways that we deal with conflict. Come on, I told you, four for four for four. The first way we deal with conflict is it's my way. My way or the? Come on, right? Listen, I know, I'm right, I've figured it out, I got a plan, I, 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 I. right? And you gotta get on my road. It's me, myself, and my, I call it. It's my way. My way is the right way. I, listen, my way sometimes is the right way, but my way also a lot of times is the miserable way. You might be right, but you ain't got no peace. You might be right, but you can't sleep at night. Have you ever been so mad at somebody you can't sleep? And, come, listen, and you write. <laughs> that part. And they're wrong. At the house, <laughs> drooling, sleeping, ain't thinking about you at all. And they're wrong. But you write like this, I can't believe. <laughs> I don't want to be right. I want to have peace. Yeah. Right? A peace that surpasses understanding. So it don't matter if I'm right or wrong, I'm cool. Because nothing is better to me than sleep in the name of Jesus. <laughs> so we've got my way. I want it my way. And then when we fail at the my way, because my way always fails, we try to flip it up and we do your way. Okay, fine. Let's do it your way. And you do it their way, which also fails. You know, so you're doing their thing, their thing, their, them, 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 them. Okay, we're going to do it like you. And you, you follow their path, and you're still miserable. They're miserable because you're miserable. So there's still no unity. So then you, you I know, we're going to go halfway. We're going to do some of you and some of me. 50-50. That'll work. Eh, we're getting closer, but we're not there. Because I want to tell you this, guys. 50% is failure. If your kids bring home a 50% on their test, what grade is that? Oh, an F. So it's failing in school, but we think it's success in relationship. Listen, 50-50 is not success, it's failing. It's 100, 100 coming together to produce one. So it takes all of you, it takes all of them 
becoming one to create real relational success, which means the only way that relationships really find fulfillment in work. Listen, you can be married and miserable. You can be married and not have purpose. You can be married and all these things, but if you really want to know the true success, it's God's way. God has a way when it comes to conflict, and today I'm going to teach you what that looks like. So God has a way when it comes to conflict. Everybody say God's way. Well, what is God's way, PT? God's way is I go to him and allow him to do the work in me, not them. So when it comes to conflict, when it comes to the abrasiveness of a relationship, I go to God to do the work in me, not them. So so, so let let me kind of unpack this. Because I've found in my life that when you begin to get close to God, when you get into the proximity of God, when you get close to Jesus, what will happen is conflicts naturally resolve themselves. You don't have to fix them. They just fix themselves. I've seen God do it again and again and again. I remember one time I was working with a couple, and they were get couples counseling, and I, was, we, I gave them a book, and they didn't read it because they don't, you know, it's like... Get, look, Like, do y'all really want to fix your marriage? Like, if you don't want to read a book, I can't help you. And we went through two or three sessions, and they were like, and I was like, okay, you know what? This is what we're going to do. And you don't do this, I don't know what to tell you. I said, when you wake up, before you guys get out of bed, I don't care who wakes up first, what I want you to do is I want you to pray with one another for 15 minutes. Pray together. Together for 15 minutes. But what about my breath? Listen, we're trying to save your marriage. I want you to pray together. And then what I want you to do is I want you to spend two or three minutes after that praying for one another. I want you to pray for them. And what ended up happening is guess what happened to their marriage? It miraculously fixed itself. Because a marriage that seeks God first, those conflicts naturally. So what happened with the two of them is they didn't fix each other. God began to work on them, and they fixed themselves. And when they fixed themselves, guess what happened? Their marriage was great. They still go to our church right now. And, and that, that's amazing to me. I think so many times the answer is all around us. It's so simple, and it's right before us. But we're looking for some way to fix it, but it should be more difficult. How about we just start off by seeking God together every morning? And let's see what God will do. See, Ecclesiastes says in chapter 3, it says there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And I love this scripture because, you know, they, there was somebody who sang a song. You know the song? Like, for every mm, turn, turn, turn. And I don't know the words, but they use this scripture. You know what I'm saying? You guys know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all in here old enough to know who that was. Y'all know who, Right? And, and it's, it's based from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and it's talking about times and seasons and things like that. But one of the things that I found is it talks a lot about conflict in this particular scripture. In fact, when you look at verse number 5, it says there's a time to scatter stones and there's a time to gather them. And you've always heard the expression, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. So actually what stones are is they're a representation of conflict in the Bible. The Bible uses stones to, to reveal conflict, Jesus' tomb was made out of a stone. He went in, conquered, that's conflict, conquer, right? Death, hell, and the grave, and then he came out of the stone, the tomb, right? We see that Golgotha was a place where there was a stone. Conflict, cross, restoration, freedom, right? So conflict is found in stones, and what God is trying to show us this morning is that when it comes to conflict, offenses, hurts, brokenness, and all that stuff, you can either choose to pick those up and hurl them at people, or you can choose to gather them. Well, PT, man, I don't know if I fully understand what you're saying. Let me give it to you this way. There was a gentleman in the Bible, you guys hear all the time, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? They were kind of like the fathers of the faith. Well, Jacob actually, who, who was Isaac's son, he like did some stuff, got his brother's blessing, but he found somebody he liked. Come on, fellas, you remember when you seen her the first time? I remember. 
outside that main rib shack. And he saw his woman, Rachel. Have you seen her? Tell me, have you seen her? Seen her? Ooh. And Rachel was like, and listen, his brothers were in the background like, do, 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 Have you seen her? Right? And Jacob sees Rachel and he's like, well, I got to have her. So he goes to her dad because that was the custom back in the day. And he's like, hey, Laban, man, listen, Rachel is fire. I'm sorry, sir. I shouldn't have said that. But your daughter is so beautiful. I want to marry her and make her my wife. And Laban was like, well, okay, man, I think I know your daddy, Isaac. You know, you look like you come from good stock, man. We're going to work this out. So what I want you to do is you're going to work for me for seven years. And after seven years, I'm going to give you my daughter. Imagine that, fellas. You want to talk about commitment? Huh? You want to talk? Yeah, y'all, the, all the fellas are like. <laughs> seven years. So Jacob wants Rachel so bad, he goes to work for Laban seven years. Seven years comes, goes, and all of a sudden, it's the wedding night. You know what I'm saying? Wedding night's there. It's like, yeah, we ready. And, and, and it's the honeymoon, y'all. He's been waiting seven years for this girl. He gets his tent. He's got his bath and body works in there. Smell good. Wallflowers. Candles burning. Went and got him some oils. Turns out the lights. And his girl comes in. He's like, oh, girl, I've been waiting for you. Makes love to her. And what he thought was the best night of his life. And Jacob wakes up in the morning, Ugh. sun is coming in, he's sitting back, relaxed, opens up one eye, looks, opens up the other eye, and then rubs his eyes, gets the sleep out of his eyes and looks over, and that ain't Rachel, that's her sister. <laughs> Could you imagine waking up the next morning? And her sister is in the bed. So here is this woman, Leah, who the Bible says was not very pleasing to the eye. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I'm trying to figure out in my mind, how did this guy get in the room with her sister? So he goes to Laban like, hold on, man, you tricked me. Man, I, said, I worked seven years for, for Rachel. You gave me Leah. And Laban was like, man, listen, I'm sorry. I probably should have told you. If you would have read the actual contract, you would have saw in them little letters at the bottom that our custom is you got to marry the older one before the younger one. You can't do it in reverse. So I'm going to give you Rachel. Calm down. But you just got to work another seven years. And the Bible says that Jacob worked with Laban. And it took almost 20 years total. It wasn't 14. It was almost 20 years he works for Laban. He ends up getting Rachel, marries her. And for 20 years, Laban changes his wages and messes with him. And he finally has enough. He's like, man, you know what? I'm out of here. Takes his wives. He's like, Leah, Rachel, let's go. I'm out of here. Your daddy is crazy. He grabs his goat, takes his goat. and like, we're leaving. Laban is mad. Like, hold on a second, man. My, 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 my workforce is leaving. And I want my goat. So what happens is Laban pursues Jacob. And look at what happens. Because Jacob knows there's about to be conflict. And the Bible says in Genesis 31, 46, that Jacob says to his family, his relatives, gather some what? Do you think Jacob was offended by how Laban was treating him? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. So he could have, in this moment, got stones to throw or to gather. But look at what he does. So they took the stones and they did what? They gathered them. They piled them. And the Bible says they ate there by the heap. Why did they gather them? Because, listen, in the Old Testament, the gathering of stones is a representation of building an altar before God. What would it look like in your conflict that if instead of bickering with one another, our first response was, let's pray and ask God for wisdom in this matter. 
But, but pastor, we're just talking about taking out the trash. Yeah, I know. But what if we came from a place like, listen, I don't want to fight. Let's, let's just pray, God. Just, just do a work in us. It's just trash, God. Help us to have a willingness to do the little things and not allow the little things to destroy the big thing you're doing in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. It's pretty hard to fight with somebody. It's, it's pretty hard to go back to 1914. I know, I just keep going further back, right? Before we get done, I'm going to be in the 1700s. But isn't it hard to fight with someone if, if their first response is, hey, let's just pray for wisdom that God will help us right now. Because see, what I've found about fighting is it takes two. And if I choose to remove myself from the conflict, well, then we don't have a game to play anymore. Now, I don't get to remove myself from the conflict in that I ignore the situation. That's off. Because that, we do that too. We're going to act like it's not happening. It's happening. The situation is happening, and it's irresponsible for us not to handle it. But the question is, is how are we going to handle it? I say it this way. Conflict can't continue without my participation. And what I found is when you start arguing with someone, when you stop arguing, you know what they do? They stop too. So let me give you the four solutions as we get ready to wrap up our message on this morning. Because the Bible is telling us specifically that we've got to be transformed. But pastor, you don't know my situation, my marriage. You don't know what I've been going through. You're right, I don't. But let me ask you this. It doesn't matter what your situation is. Let me ask you, have you allowed God to transform you? In the situation, as crazy as it is, have you sought God to transform you? Because that's what he's wanting to do. God doesn't want to change them. He wants to transform you. God doesn't want to change them so they'll be better for you. He wants to transform you so that he can use you to change them. In fact, Paul said in Galatians, he said, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You know what I found is that when I crucify, my, crucify myself daily, I found that dead people don't argue. right? There's no conflict. They're easy peasy. So I said, okay, God, well, what, what does that look like in real life? And then he gave me these four common, uncommon responses to conflict. So these are going to be different than what we talked about the first time. And the first one is actually this. So the first uncommon response to conflict, the way that we've got to handle it is we've got to say this, I will act and not react. What does that mean? You have to pre-decide, church. You have to pre-decide fights. Pastor Faith and I, this week, we're dealing with some things in our home and things like that, and we, we pre-decided what it would look like. If this happens, this is what we're going to do. If that happens, this is what it's going to look like. And we begin pre-deciding. We've got things, mechanisms in place that if I'm talking about scenarios, if this is happens, this is how we're going to handle it. This is what we're, and we pre-decide before the fight. And if we pre-decide, all of a sudden now we're just fulfilling what we said we were going to do rather than reacting based on how we feel in the moment. Pastor Faith did a great message on 21 Days about pre-deciding, right? You got to pre-decide, pre-decide. Ephesians 4.26 says it this way. He said, in your anger, do not sin. So you're allowed to be mad. Everybody clap your hands because you can be mad. The Bible says I can be mad. But you want to know what else it says? You can't sin. But what does that look like? It looks like this. It, it says, do not let the sun go down while you are still what? Angry. And, do, and listen, so the sin is this. You can be mad, but if you go to sleep mad, you sin. Whoa. Whoa. So 
Why is that so important? Because he said, if you go to bed mad, you give the devil a foothold in your house. Nobody in here wants to invite the devil in their home. So that means we got to solve problems before we go to bed. So my wife and I, listen, we've had a couple of, we've had a couple of roundabouts, y'all. In 1642, one time, we... <laughs> we but, but in all seriousness, we have had times where we were up till 3, 3.30, 4 in the morning, resolving, right? We got to fix this. And listen, you know what I found? When you start getting into them later hours, your flesh starts to weaken. Your pride starts to go down. And all of a sudden, you become a little bit more rational and like, listen, we just need to come up with a solution. And then all of a sudden, we're able to, and you want to know what's funny? Is when you come up with that solution, if you do it the right way, you go to sleep like that. The peace of God will come in. I'd be like, listen, girl, I want to sleep on this purple mattress that we got, girl. Like, I, I just want to go to sleep, babe, whatever you want. <laughs> no, that ain't how it works. But we do figure it out. You got to figure it out. So let me give you guys some rules. These are not in the Bible. These are Boyd rules. These are rules for our house and our marriage. I think that everybody should steal them and use them for your house. Are you ready? The first thing is this. We never put it off. We ain't going to talk about it tomorrow. We're going to talk about it right now. But it's not always convenient. Well, let me tell you, there's nothing more important than my marriage. Basketball practice ain't more important. Church ain't more important. There's nothing that exists in my life that's more important than my relationship with my wife outside of my relationship with God. And God wants me to fix it. He just said it. So we don't put it off. We going to talk about it? Let's talk about it right now. Second thing is we're not going to yell about it. This is hard for me because I'm super passionate. And, and most people think I'm yelling. I'm not. Like, in fact, I'm offended. And, I've, and, and listen, it's not their fault. It's my fault. But my passion comes out in decibels. But in my heart, I promise you, I am not angry. But God was like, that's an excuse. Get yourself together because your mouth is a door. So we will check each other if somebody's getting too loud. Hold on a second. Let's calm down. So we're not getting loud. The third thing is we never say never or always. You never, you always. Cuss words. Those are F-bomb grenades in our house. No, no never or always. The another thing is we don't call names. You lazy, none, none of that. There are no names being thrown around here. They have a proper name that their mama gave them. That's the only name that we use them. Sometimes if you get real passionate, you, you use their middle name. Come on, somebody. Right? The, the fifth thing is we don't get historical. I put that in there because, like I said, my wife, we're not going back. You know, honestly, fellas, can I get an amen from you? Y'all don't even remember what happened yesterday. Right? And listen, I'm not telling you that they're, but I'm telling you the truth. Like you're trying to recall something that they're, like they're, look, Dante right now is literally in his mind. He's trying to remember yesterday. They ain't got to think about it. They know. And then the, the sixth thing is that we never threaten divorce. We never question the fact that maybe we shouldn't have gotten together. There's never an out. Never. And what we found is if there's not an out, we have to find a solution. We have to. Because I'm not going to be, I don't want to be miserable. And, and listen, I don't know anybody who wants to be miserable. Even unsaved people don't want to be miserable. So if we say like, listen, we got to figure this out. We got to come up with a solution because listen, I want to love you. I want us to have a great, fun, joy-filled marriage. I want us to be thriving. I want us to be having fun. And ha like, I want that for our lives. Like, don't, do you want that? They're going to be like, yeah, I want that too, baby. Well, let's, let's work on trying to do that. But if we know that we can get out, we'll never go all in. Because we're like, well, you know, if it doesn't work, I'm just going to get out. Now, listen, there are situations and circumstances that that happens, right? Some of us have gotten out. Some of us may have been. And listen, that doesn't mean it's over for you. And don't allow the devil right now to make you feel like you did something wrong back then. Because the Bible says you are brand new. Amen? So he's making you new. Say I'm new. You're new. All right? Which leads me to the second response. 
Number two is I'm going to focus on the good things in that person. I don't care how messed up you think they are, you got to find some good in them. I don't care what it is. Man, you know what? When you put on that Old Spice deodorant, man, you smell so good. Whatever it is, find good in them. Search for it and then highlight it and say it to them. Find the good. Find the good. Find the good. Philippians 4, 8, and 9 says it this way. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely. It says, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. It says, anything. Think about it. But it doesn't stop there because in the next verse, Paul says, so whatever you've learned or received or you've heard from me or you've seen in me, put it into what? Practice. Which means whatever is lovely, noble, pure, all those things, I got to find those things in people and put that into practice and let them know and let them know and let them know. Which leads me to the third thing. I'm going to apply God's grace to them. We do a lot of forgive me, punish them. It's amazing to me how much we're willing to receive, but how little we're actually willing to give. Do you know that Jesus told a story because he had something to say about this? He told a story about a man who was in debt and he owed over a million dollars and his creditor forgave his million dollar debt. And when the man who should have went to prison was released to be free, there was somebody who owed him less than $10. And that man called for the person who owed him $10 to be put in jail. How much have you been forgiven that you're willing to throw somebody else in jail over one, two, three little things? Jesus called him wicked and said, you should have shown more grace and mercy, but because you didn't, not only will you go, but your family will pay. I don't want that. God has been too good to me, guys. And listen, it's hard because relationships can be hard people can be difficult they can be mean they can say things they can hurt you in ways that you never thought you could hurt but all God keeps taking me back to is the cross when the son of man who had been skinned they said he had Virtually no skin on his body. You could see the muscle fibers. He was hit in his head over 100 times with a rod. They spit on him. Threw vinegar on his wounds. Shoved a crown of thorns on his head and mocked him. Save yourself. And as he willingly hung, one of his last words was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What if your prayer was, God, transform me so that I knew who I was, so that I could have the confidence to be able to say, God, forgive them. They don't know who I am. Not, God, forgive them. They don't know who I am. I'm I'm PT, pastor of the city. No. They don't know that I'm your son. They don't know that I'm loved. They don't know that I'm chosen. They don't know that I'm anointed and called. Forgive them. In fact, use me to show them who you are. 
But the only way you can do that is you have to be willing to allow God to be in control. Romans 12 says this, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. We like that scripture. Get them, God. Sick them. But in the very next verse, verse 20, he says, because he knew we were going to think that. He says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. What if you got into a crazy fight? And instead of yelling, you fix the greatest meal that your spouse has ever had. He said, oh, that's too far, Pastor. Hold on a second. It says, if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And then it goes on to say, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Oh, we like that. But do you know I studied this scripture? And do you know that it, it doesn't mean what you think it means? that coals were actually considered a gift in the Jewish cult culture. That burning coals were a gift that you would give to your neighbor so that they could keep their house warm. See, burning coals were given to somebody to do something on the inside. And God is saying, when you show them who I am, you're giving them burning coals that will begin to change who they are on the inside. We're not giving them fourth degree burns on their head. We're changing the way that they're thinking. That's the head. And he says in verse 21, do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? So how do we handle conflict? By doing good. And there's only one way you can do that. And that's number four. You just gotta remember the grace that God had for you. You gotta remember who you used to be. You gotta remember how many times this week God gave you another chance. You gotta remember how faithful he's been to you, how he's never left nor forsaken you. You gotta think about when he chose you when nobody else wanted you, when he never gave up on you, when he's loved you when you were unlovable, you gotta remember. And if you can remember God's grace in your life, it won't be so hard to give that same grace into somebody else's life. Would you stand to your feet? I'm gonna ask everybody in the room right now as we get ready to close, just to close your eyes and to bow your heads. Because I want you in this moment right here to just take a moment because listen, conflict is inevitable. But what are we gonna do when it comes? So right now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want you to think about just how good God has been. Do you remember what you were, how lost you were when he found you? Do you remember how out of control your life was? your family? Do you remember the anxiety, the wondering? Do you remember going through relationship after relationship after relationship looking for love? I remember being lost. I remember being found. I remember blowing it time after time after time again and him still saying, this is my son, this is my daughter, I love you. So if you're in the room right now and you know that you need to give your life back to him, maybe God is calling your name for the first time today. But you know that the way that you've been handling conflict is really just a reflection of your distance in your relationship with him. 
and you want to rekindle that relationship. You don't want to hear about other people's relationship. You want to experience your own relationship. If that's you when you're in this room, I'm going to ask you just to slip your hand in the air and say, I want that. I want something different. I want God to transform me, to make me new, to make me better. See, hands are up everywhere in this room, and I want to thank you for your courage. So, Father, right now, God, I thank you, God, for this word. I thank you, God, that you're teaching us, God, about relationships. You're teaching us about love, commitment. You're teaching us about communication. But, God, you're also teaching us about conflict. And, Father, I just pray right now, God, over every heart and every mind, God, that every person under the sound of my voice, God, would make room for you. That our first response wouldn't be to react, but our first response would be to gather our stones and to make an altar, altar before you. Father, on today, God, I ask that you would forgive me, wash me, and cleanse me of my unrighteousness. I pray, God, that you would restore me back to a relationship with you so that I could come to know you, God, in a very real and authentic way. God, I don't want to know about you anymore. God, I want to know who you are. I want to experience your love, your grace, your mercy. I want to experience the purpose and destiny, God, you have for my life. So, Father, right now, God, I pray, God, that every marriage in this room, God, you would restore it. God, that it would come alive. That how they interact with one another, God, would be completely changed and transformed. I pray over every sibling, parent, child relationship that there would not be tension, there would be trust. I pray, God, that children would honor their parents and parents would sow into their children. Father, I pray for our relationships, our friendships, our work relationships, God, I pray that they would be fruitful and that we would be the light that somebody else may see you in us and be drawn to a relationship with you. Father, I thank you, God, for what you're doing, and I thank you for what you're going to do in our lives, in this church, and in this region, this state and even the world. God, we are revival. Revive us again. In Jesus' name, amen.